<laughs> you can see me and hear me and hear me and see me. You might be able to see these other two guys too because we might be loading it up this way today where it's a little different. So we're here with one of our faithful viewers, a guy that I've known, we were talking about it a little earlier, since 2013, X Factor. You guys go way back. How about that? All the way back seven years. Seven years to Duke University where Will was a camper and I was coaching. And we'll talk a little bit about that tonight. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the advocacy work that you're doing, Will. Um, we'll touch on some hoops. We'll share some quotes. We'll just chop it up tonight. How's that sound? Sure. Yeah, I'm very happy to be part of this. We're glad to have you, man. X Factor, how are things out there in Chicago? You know what? Things are pretty good. The past couple of days were really, really cold, and today was pretty nice. By pretty nice, I mean 45, which is pretty nice for us, I suppose. But, um, you know, blue we're getting skies? ready for – Blue skies, though? Oh, yeah, blue skies. Beautiful, beautiful blue skies. Uh, I know pretty soon I'm going to be praying for 45, so I'll take this. Man. How are things there where you are, Will? What's the weather like there? It's it started to snow a couple days ago, and and it and it was in the fifties or sixties when the previous weeks, and it's sort of dropped down into the thirties and forties just this weekend. Colorado, especially the Denver area, which is five hours away from Hayes, Kansas, got at least five or six inches of snow, and we probably got like one inch of snow out here on Sunday night, and it's supposed to heat up um back um here and this is something that i'm not used to usually not getting snow to like after thanksgiving from being from maryland and moving out to kansas for grad school at fort hayes state university well i'll give a little background i mentioned that we met at duke so you were out there i'm i admired your work ethic and your determination and i remember you stood out and now, seven years later, we're still in touch and we're having you as a guest on our show. So um, a graduate, college graduate with a bachelor's degree from Salis Salis Salisbury? Yes. Is that how you pronounce it? Salisbury University um, is undergrad, now working on your master's at Fort Hayes State University in Kansas. And tell us, tell us a little bit about what you're studying now and we'll go back to some high school stuff in a minute, but let's touch on that real quick. Yeah, so um, currently I'm at Fort Hayes State University in Hayes, Kansas, which is about five hours away from Denver and about like closer, I would say around three and a half um, hours to Kansas City, um, Kansas and Kansas City, Missouri, where I'm working on my master's degree in higher education and student affairs. And this degree basically prepares me to work in any role in higher education from disability services to diversity and inclusion to athletics administration um, in the higher um, education level. And I sort of like wanted to go um, in this route because I'm very passionate about helping all students succeed in getting the right development and the services and supports what they want to, but especially mainly students with disabilities since I grew up with a disability on the autism spectrum myself and pull, plowed my way through college, succeeding and going above and beyond with my same work ethic, which I learned from athletics and being a camper at Duke basketball camp while being on the autism spectrum. That's incredibly powerful, man. And, you know, it, you can definitely attest to that better than most because you've been through it. You know, you really, truly understand it. So that's awesome that you're trying to go that route and, you know, learn more and more about it. Um, you know, it's definitely something that people should educate themselves on and, and become more aware of. Absolutely. Tell us, Will, a little bit about um, ableism and talk to us a little bit about um, how people can be an ally and advocate for people that have, that are, is differently abled. Is that an ableism word? Or talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, so sure. So um, ableism Basically, I would say most simple terms is letting people without disabilities having um, power over people with disabilities and putting disabled people more towards um, the bottom pole um, be, be, because they have a um, disability. And, and there's a couple terms in the disability field which we try to 
to differentiate, differentiate between called people first language where, where basically people like have a name before their disability and show that they're important as a regular person or identity first language which identifies them um, as, um, as a disabled person. And we definitely, as a culture for people with and without disabilities um, need to um, understand um, as an ally that, that, that you need to create an environment of inclusion in whatever you do. So, so as an ally, you wouldn't speak up for a person with a disability without their permission because, because they wanna be able to do something um, by their selves. And, and especially if you have a role where you work with a person with a disability, you have to use the framework of universal design where, where you already have accessibility in mind for people with disabilities, um, as well as incorporating that in any field, which I, which I do a lot of research on, universal design for learning, which you have multiple means of communication, engagement, and expression for people. So, so they're able to get a skill depending on their development, like, and, and in the sports world, our universal design for learning can be applied through the concept of competitive and engineering. So for example, as a coach, if you're doing a drill that maybe has like a three point um, shot, which has a longer line, you can identify a shorter line for them based on their strengths, where it would be the same amount of, of points, it's just modifying the activity to make it competitive for them. You're always wanting to compete against yourself. That's one thing that I've really learned is you're not comparing yourself to other people. You shouldn't be, all you can worry about is trying to be better than you were yesterday. And I think that that idea of making it towards a challenge for you Similar, similar, sim, similarly, similar, similarly, similar, similarly. Words are hard. Words are tough sometimes. Words are hard sometimes. <laughs> Let's hear you say that. Sim, similarly. Similarly. Okay. Similarly. You nailed it. The this difficulty guy. level about the same as somebody that isn't isn't as challenging for so. What would you say is a phrase or a word that you hear that maybe, I mean, isn't really known as a phrase that people shouldn't use? Yeah, I'm like, I, the word inspiration definitely comes to my mind because if you're telling a person with a disability they're the inspiration, you're having them look a lot differently um, in society. And there's a concept out there in the news, in, especially in the media for people with disabilities called inspiration porn. And there's a guy out there that says, no disability is a bad um, attitude. And we have to understand that you have to include people with disabilities just as you do everybody else. There may be an understanding that people may need modifications, but they may have the same skills in this environment but, but the current situation climate of what you're coaching or what you're working into might not be the best fit for them at first. And you have to work with them to identify their needs and just not say they win for being here. You have to bring them along, bring them on slowly, identify mentors and mentees and different opportunities for them to succeed because we all shall be, have leaders too. And this, I'm going to bring up a quote, which this definitely goes out um, by Ed Roberts, who was one of our founders of our independent living movement for people with disabilities. And he started as a student at University of California, Berkeley in the 1960s as a student in the um, physically disabled students um, program where, where he could only live in the old Cal hospital because he had an iron lung and he left um, that and, and helped create accessibility um, in Berkeley, California and created the first independent living center, which we have today with independent living centers across the country and in every state so people with disabilities can live independently. And the quote that he said is, 
we have to get out there and change the old attitudes. Love that. That's very, very powerful because I feel like a lot of people say things and use terminology that they don't necessarily understand is hurtful. Um, and that's just completely off a lack of awareness and a lack of self teaching, right. To, you know, not really understand that what they're saying is hurtful. So I think it's very important to, to kind of take in what you're saying and, and, you know, really take it to heart because you don't know that your words that don't mean much to you can mean the world to somebody else in a negative way. Yeah. De like it's definitely a thing and, and, and out there and a disability activist and blogger by the name of Lydia Brown actually created a whole um, glossary on their blog about words that are considered ableist and, and had a list of terms that you should be using instead of these ableist um, terminologies out there. And like one um, ableist terminology out there is sort of like, like muting someone because because it's considering to somebody who is deaf who's not able to hear yeah you don't want to yeah muting someone that's an interest i mean you hear that bitch is bipolar it's like no she's probably just a bad person you know that doesn't mean yeah. she has a bipolar disorder or that person, you know, there is a lot of those words that you, and that article you sent me actually, Will, I read through there and there are some of them that I was like, wow, I didn't know that was an ableist word or phrase. And so that was really interesting. So I appreciate you sharing that. Yes, also, I mean. The article by Debbie, Debbie's Antonelli. Antonelli. Yeah, and yeah, and basically the story with Debbie Antonelli is that She's a women's college basketball and WNBA commentator um, on ESPN. And about four years ago, she um, came out in the Washington Post in an article about a son by the name of Frankie um, who has um, Down um, syndrome and how she wanted to create an environment where Frankie, where he could be inclusive in our everyday K through 12 general um, education. And, and at times for parents who have um, disabilities, it's not easy to fight a school um, administration to have them included in general education classrooms because there are some special education directors out there that completely want every person with a disability together. And, and, and she sort of challenged and told these teachers, treat him like you do um, everybody um, else. And, and as well, Frankie, like during his free time, like he was always helping his mom coach her older son's team on the sideline, dealing with the clipboard to keep him in an environment where he can be able and be very um, included. And, and definitely that article is something that I've taken to heart because, because I've been showing that we need to have more inclusion in our sports at the high school um, at the college level and just this past um, year there was a freshman at Kent State by the name of Kalen Bennett who's on the autism spectrum himself and he was the first division one scholar um, athlete with with that disability and previously before that Michigan State I mean had um, Anthony Iani who was a walk-on who played with Draymond Green there. That's incredible I love I love that story, Debbie. I read that going on the offense, right? Wasn't that what it was called? Going on the offense against Down syndrome. First Down syndrome. First Down syndrome. I that hit home so much for me. Um, you know, with everything that I've been going through, and you start to feel sorry for yourself, and you realize that, man, let's just you know to treat people that have autism or Down syndrome or you know, anything else to say, oh, they're different or, oh, I'm so sorry for you, Will. Like, don't be sorry. Will, the thrill is a dude. Like, don't, I don't introduce people with, hey, this is, this is a disabled person named Will. It's, no, this is my friend, Will. Difference, big difference in that. 
huge difference yeah. to him. People really need to understand that. And like you said, dude, how cool is it, you know, at, at the highest level in Michigan State playing with Draymond, or Draymond Green? I didn't even do that. You know what I mean? Like, there's a lot of people that would beg, you know, and pray to do that, you know, doing it at the highest, highest level. So, they're very valuable. Yeah, especially just, like, we have to understand that that the one model of disability which you're referencing, Brant, is the charity model of disability where people with disability are seen more as as pity and that they need um, a cure. And, and recently, like, I was listening to a webinar with a disability activist even from Texas by the name of Alejandrina Guzman. And, and what she was even telling when she was working in this Texas state legislator's office because of how small and physically disabled this person was, someone asked her, can I even pray for you? And, and like, I take offense to that. And we have to work more using a more social model for people with disabilities where we work on identifying their access need so they can be included and do whatever that we can possibly to make sure that they're having a good time and are comfortable and that they can have the social environment that they always dream of. And, and, and special education scholars reference this article for IEP meeting purposes called Why Is This Cake um, on Fire? And in this article, they, they basically talk about the steps about how they include people with disabilities in the planning process of their um, IEP meeting where they get to sort of create invitations to who they want to invite and plan the different parts of the meeting and get to share their stories that help them succeed in the classroom. I think that being able to include and there, there we've come so far for in women's rights and um you know minorities rights i'm a little worried about if the affordable care act goes away what's going to happen to people that have those needs it doesn't i don't it's a humane issue to me yeah and yeah and definitely especially once people with disabilities are out of like K through 12 education, they have to at times apply for home and community-based services, which are government programs from our Department of Health and Human Services Association on um, community living, where people with disabilities like get support to receive in their home for care and support in the community, like wherever they go and and disability activists and advocates have been rallying these past couple months with with especially um multiple disability organizations including the national council on independent of living and the center for public representation to call our legislators to keep home and community-based services um going along with medicaid and and having aging and disability waivers in our states that it's it's hitting home for me more now than ever with my daughter being diagnosed with a syndrome without a name that's been very challenging but i've also learned already so much just about advocacy and disability rights and i've learned a lot also just compassion on when i hear when i tell people that hearing what they say and how they react. Sometimes they don't know that they're saying stuff that pisses me off, to be honest. Does that like, when they're like, oh, maybe maybe we can fix your daughter. And it's like, my daughter, my daughter doesn't really need fixing. You know, it's not like she's broken. She is, she's gonna live her life. She's on a different trajectory. We're gonna move her at the pace of her own success. We're not gonna try to, have her compare her to any other two and a half year old, four year old when she's four, we're gonna compare her to how she was yesterday. And it's changed kind of, I would say my perception on what it would be like to be a dad, but having a daughter now that is disabled has been a challenge, but also I've learned a lot of empathy. And I, I mean, I haven't shared with a whole lot of people this, um, it's still pretty new news, but 
Will, I just want you to know, man, you've helped me a lot, a lot more than you know, because there's a lot of this that I don't know. And it's still kind of new. And I'll never forget when I saw the results of the test, when they, te they, so they tested all 20,000 genes of Maggie. And there's one gene that if it's mutated, it comes back and her gene, the H-U-W-E-1 gene is mutated, which is causing apnea, seizures, short stature, all these things that we're, we're wondering why. And it was, it was kind of nice that we got an answer because they kept coming back saying, we don't know why she's not on the charts for growth. We don't know why she's so little. And we were struggling with it because we weren't getting any answers. They tested for Down syndrome. They tested for multiple sclerosis, cerebral palsy, all the tests that they could do. And all the, just coming back, they kept coming back saying, we don't know why Maggie's having apnea. We don't know why she's having to take seizure medication. So I'll never forget when we got the paperwork back, it was all in black and white, except for one word in red that said positive. And that was, uh, and the rest of the page was all stuff that I couldn't understand because it was all doctor jargon and variations of the gene. And, but they call it a swan, which is a syndrome without a name. So it's a new, diagnosis that they haven't known about for really a long time eight years ago they discovered this mm -hmm. so it's so new dr down was the doctor that did a lot of the research on down syndrome the syndrome maggie has they don't have a name for it yet because it's so new it's so uncommon it's so rare that they don't have a name for it yet so there's a lot of learning and a lot of unknown and a lot of questions that I have that we can't get answers to because there's not old people with this diagnosis because there's old people that have probably have this syndrome, but they don't know because they didn't know to test this until eight years ago. So that's been X factor. That's been going on. Um, Will, I appreciate all your support, man. And you've been there for me. And it's just been, a, it's been an adjustment of the thinking, I would say but it's not like I'm going to love Maggie any less. It's, and some people act like, Oh man, that sucks. And it's like, have you, nobody that's ever met Maggie says that sucks. Cause that little girl has a smile. That is the most infectious thing that you've ever seen. It's you can't see Maggie smile and you not start smiling. So for people to insinuate that she needs fixing, or that there's got to be some type of new drug or medication that's going to make her normal. The things I want to say to people when they say that, I bite my lip because I know they don't know better, but it does. It's just like, dude, it's not, that's not, that's not, Yeah. you know what I'm saying? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And going back, I mean, historically in disability laws, especially in the 1800s and in the 1900s, so many big cities, including San Francisco and Chicago had a municipal code and law called the ugly law, which like which prevented people who were more physically disabled and looked ugly and freaky to be fined if they were even seen in public. And now we've had a long way for people with disabilities who can become like entrepreneurs like Damon John from Shark Tank who has autism his self. And, and, and the one thing to understand too, is that, is that we have to help people with disabilities, like start not always thinking about black and white. Like we may need some extra coaching, some extra mentoring, some other um, support and get people to go on offense with them in whatever they do and have people that want to go on your team with you and being able to support others as well, the one thing that I've learned over time has been having more autonomy for other people and not always being about myself has definitely been a process that everything can't be always about you with the life that I've had um, previously. And I've been always, um, from when I was in college at Salisbury University, I always thought of the idea, the idea that you have to think like a champion to be like the champion and at Salisbury University, I, I like I was very 
in, involved and always wanted to stay in athletics. And I got to officiate intramurals for four years at Salisbury University. My, my first two years just officiating basketball and flag football and then becoming a head intramural supervisor where I was a head ref in floor hockey, basketball, volleyball, and getting the chance to be around national fast pitch um, Hall of Fame or um, in Margie Knight, who was at Salisbury University for a long time and getting to know her and seeing just from a fan about how the tactics she worked with her softball team and seeing the most winningest lacrosse coach in college of history currently in Jim Berkman at Salisbury University on how every single one of his um, senior um, classes have come away with a national championship and getting having an opportunity to be around Dr. Ron Sires, who's the associate head baseball coach at Salisbury University, as well as a professor now in secondary education and physical education, getting to take athletic coaching classes from him and getting to learn about being a better leader through his learning leadership um, class, where he taught me the five best practices of transformational leadership by Kuzis and Posner, which is model the way, inspire a shared vision, enable others to act, um, encourage um, the heart to, um, as, um, as well as just challenge the process in yourself. Gotta send me that, send me that one, Will, those five, that was, yeah, I feel, I feel that. But I know, and I think a lot of it's how you say it too, because if, because I'm inspired and I know that was one of the words that we said, but with you, Pont, with you, I'm inspired by both of you guys for what you guys are doing with your lives. And so I, it is, it is awesome to see guys that I like excel. And there's a lot of people that I like, and but not all of them are excelling. And there's people that I don't like that excel. But when people I like excel, that that makes me want to go. That makes me want to get up and go. And from meeting you, you're really shy when we first met, Will. I don't know. You've your confidence level has grown, and you. I love it when you send me messages about you knocking down threes in. Uh, out there at Fort Hayes and getting some recognition and what was the nickname they gave you at the rec center? Um, they, they gave me right before I had coronavirus. Um, they um, called me the goat, the goat, the goat, you know what? Not too many people are deserving of that nickname. And I think that you are one of the people who are. I love Will the Thrill because it is a thrill when you hop on. I'm always excited to see Will Freed is joining the call. Yeah, yeah. And like, since I was a younger kid, like I always wanted the opportunity to be able to play, um, I mean, on the most competitive basketball team um, as I could. And, um, and I was somebody that didn't even make the middle school um, basketball team, the high school JV, almost made high school varsity as a junior, but I was always playing rec recreational basketball. And like, I knew, I knew like right after it was the summer between going into my um, sophomore and junior year of high school, where I was, uh, got, got an opportunity to play in the JCC uh, Maccabi games, which is a um, Jewish um, North American four day tournament Olympic style um, competition where you get to compete against Jews from different um, states. And I got to be on a team that um, made it to the gold medal game and, and, and won the silver um, medal in like in that tournament for our um, division. And, and I was a kid that was more the last player um, off the bench because it was just more comfort for me and, and and I didn't even play the previous two games in the tournament and my coach put me out there more as a dragon player that you don't know what somebody is going to do and I just went in there and and scored five straight points on the other team and they didn't even know what to even do because I wasn't even on the scout and and and, and definitely like well the one thing about reading John Wooden's book is that you have to reward the players who are working hard and don't always get the chances to play and maybe forgotten in some system. And you may have to find a system where they can be included because they 
have the passion, but but they may not be the great thing in one team's um, system. And this is why I've got into coaching, and I've owned, and I've connected with coaches that want to go on offense to me and want to be the most inclusive. And and in the disability employment first field, we talk about customized job employment where we put people with disabilities based. Um, on their strengths. And, and I sort of relate that to a special education scholar at Rowan University in Dr. Brent Elder, where he wrote a strengths-based um, um, IEP for people with disabilities so we can focus on them and what we want to do to succeed. Sounds. Does that sound familiar at all, X Factor? A little bit, actually. I mean, just that sometimes you're the hardest working guy Sometimes you don't get the opportunities that the others get, but you don't give up, you don't quit, you don't pout, you don't complain, you don't moan, you don't bitch about it, you show up, you show up with a little positive attitude, you bring a little energy, and maybe you'll get rewarded, but maybe not, but that shouldn't stop you from still doing what's right. Yeah, I think I've probably seen that once or twice, maybe even lived it, but I don't know. The walk-on mentality, sound, I mean, that sounds a lot like that perseverance that you've had. And now you're going to be around sports, Will, as an official and getting to do things that people didn't think you would do. And people, I mean, they're, you're doing stuff that refereeing basketball games is definitely not something that's easy. I can't do it. So I, the fact that you're doing it, if even if Pont was doing it, if anybody referees, I respect it. It's yeah. tough. It's a tough, tough gig. And you're going to get all the criticism in the world too. Oh, this is, and this is actually year number five for me going into officiating. I'm not a rookie anymore. And, and, and it all sort of started. So um, in the summer of 2016, I was working my first summer at Coach Wooten's basketball camp. And like, I, I signed up to be a coach and like, I wasn't even told that I was going to even officiate. And I find out when they're announcing all the leagues of all the coaches that you're going to be put as an official. And like I said, like, I have to go on offense and make the most with it. And I got good um, out there and, and, and sort of when I was um, my first semester in college at Salisbury University, I saw that a lot of these intramural officials weren't really hustling and said like, I've officiated before and, and, and like, I can do it. And like, and I've done it before. And like, I just bring intensity to anything um, that I have done. Intensity, bringing intensity to the party. That's just the price of admission. That's what we say at Pacific, just bringing energy. That's just to get into the door. That doesn't mean you're going to play. That doesn't mean you're going to start. But if you want to have a seat at the table, it doesn't mean you're going to eat. But if you want a seat at the table, energy is a must. Yeah. And, yeah. and what? Um, energy yeah. Then the X factor. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's literally why I'm here. You know what I mean? It's what I do. It's what I specialize in. So yeah. that's incredibly important. I can't even, I, you know, I can't even speak testament to that. Yeah. And definitely one of the things that I reference here is that um, women's college basketball commentator from the big 10 network in Shelly Till talks about how you have to have grit and no quit in anything that you want to do. And you have to show that you're the toughest, um, strongest person in the gym that you can be, be because we deserve to be here and we shouldn't be put down because of our past history and what our challenges have been. We should be able to work hard and have the same opportunities as anybody else. There no, I don't think there's anybody that's gonna put limitations on you, my daughter. Just, I think that the sky's the limit and people that say that, have they ever seen that there's footsteps on the moon? And, and for the people that for don't want to create like an inclusive disability culture, they're going to be defined by ableism the rest of their life. I mean, I mean, it's, it's just part of it. Like they have to respect it and be inclusive towards anybody and what they do. Inclusion. Inclusion. 
Well, did you have another, you, you've dropped all sorts of nuggets. Um, I, I'm really happy that you could join us as our guest, Will. Um, is there, do you have a, another quote or anything you wanna share before we sign off? Yeah, yeah, so definitely like the one thing that I'll tell you, so um, during my time at Salisbury University, I got a chance to be um, taught by one of the greatest international um, adapted physical education professors for a class called Psychosocial Aspects of Physical Education um, by this guy named Dr. Dean um, Ravitsa. And what he told me is that there is ability and disability. And he, and, he, and he told me like, you can't come up with excuses from yourself and just try to like take the shortcuts. Like you have to be in here I mean, for the long run with it and not take the easy route. And he would always just joke on me about the classes that I was taking and get into my head. And, and, and definitely the stuff that he tried to challenge me as a sophomore motivated me to even take on more bigger things and represent Salisbury University in a different way. And, and during my time at Salisbury University, I racked up intramural referee of the year. Um, I got to receive the president's diversity award for my disability um, advocacy. I received the AK um, Talbot award, which is an award for people who do work on civil rights and um, community um, inclusion, as well as getting the opportunity to um, intern for Mayor Jake Day of Salisbury, Maryland. Shout out to him who's right now in Africa serving um, in our army to protect our country in the reserves. And he's been a great mentor for me. And, and, and in response to me receiving my president's diversity award, he gave me one of his coins of honor, which he doesn't give to a lot of, of people. Say his and name one more time. Say his name one more time. Mayor Jake Day. Mayor Jake Day. Of Salisbury, Maryland. And I've been proud to be a two-time former intern for him but but like you guys won't even like this in this house that I my boss in the mayor's office and Andy Kitzrow was a former UNC student uh oh I don't have a problem with that but I know B minor probably takes issue too. I'm not gonna take too much offense to it he might he might he just might not know better you know he didn't might know be. about Duke at the time oh I mean I mean he also has a son with a disability as well so we have connected I mean very well together and and then just one De December ago I got to go present at the TASH conference flew out in Phoenix Arizona flew all the way out to Phoenix Arizona by myself came back with an award for coming in first place with a colleague and childhood friend with mine on the autism spectrum in Jake Goodman and, and competing against disability advocates who have been in the field for over 20 years. And I'm only a college student, not even at the, wasn't even at the master's level um, at the time and having pride in everything that I had done and, and just sharing my experience and getting to be at that conference with a couple of former internship bosses of mine from two different organizations and people that I've connected with over time in the field of disability advocacy and seeing all the work that these researchers, teachers, administrators, recreation service providers, disability service providers are doing to make it, I mean, more um, inclusive for people um, with disabilities. And, 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 and definitely just my time at, at Salisbury University helped me grow a lot, getting to know a couple of lacrosse players in Wilna Wesnick and Kyle Tucker, who are now playing in the major league lacrosse and how they've still checked on me and have really appreciated the work that I have done and helped them as well, even though they're a couple of years older than me now. Good shout out. I like that. Dropping some names. Good stuff, Will. I really like um, so much that you said. Grit, no quit. I, I mean, sometimes I was writing so fast because sometimes I know you get excited, Will, and you talk so fast. I'm the same way. I feel you. Sometimes I start talking and I'm just like rambling and people are like, what is he talking about? Why is he still talking? What is he talking about? I didn't know what he's talking about, but I keep going, but I'm excited. I really appreciate you and being willing. And there's things that I know I've said that 
have maybe been offensive to certain people. I love that I can feel open enough with you, Will, that if I do say something, I think you're the type of guy that would politely correct me and not let me go around and say that per special needs. Oh, or yeah, and like it, yeah, yeah, and especially like if you're around like Lydia Brown, who's a disability justice and disability activist and blogger who, who wrote those ableist language, they're, they're someone that gets a little bit more culturally offensive around them. And, and I've known them myself and I know I have to be respectful around their words and what they say, because if you say something in one of their talks, they're gonna throw you out of the bus and they're not gonna accept you. That's true. You have to be careful about that for sure. Um, and, um, and, um, and also people with disabilities at times do have things against parents of people with disabilities because the experience is very um, different but between it's two separate groups because we have people who 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 are who are coming into the field with someone with a disability for the first time and people who've been disabled their entire life for sure and that's something I always try to say that I my friends I don't know what it's like to be black. I've never been black. I've never felt unsafe when I've been pulled over by a police officer. I've never had fear when I walk into a store that something's going to happen to me. I've never been disabled. So I've never, I don't, I can't put myself in that. I'm not going to try to say, oh, I understand what it's like, or I get it. You know, everybody's got their own struggles and challenges. And there's things that I've gone through that people wouldn't believe. And I know that I love the one, don't judge my story based on the chapter that you walked in on. Because you don't know what I've been through. And you don't know what Will Freed's been through. You don't know what the X Factor's been through. So don't try to put yourself in a position where you're judging me based on this story that you think you know when people don't know. So I don't know what it's like, Will. So that's why I appreciate you sharing things like that with me. And I'm going to try to do what I can from my position and my influence to advocate. But I also know that I don't know everything. I don't know much of anything compared to somebody that has studied it like you. Yeah. Yeah. And one thing definitely that I've seen more parents with people with, with disabilities, like once they have a child with a disability, like in whatever role they do, for example, like in coaching, like you would be more open to having other people with disabilities on your team and not all disabilities are visible there are people that have hidden disabilities and don't actually really disclose disclose it because they feel embarrassed and they need a sense of comfort and inclusion and access that's so true that's so true well i'm definitely gonna stand in front of you stand behind you stand beside you whatever you need in support and I love what you're teaching. I got to listen to your presentation that you did for Salisbury State uh, or Salisbury University. Fort Hayes State is where you are now. And I get confused because Hayes, Kansas, but Hayes isn't a state, right? No. Yeah, so how, I mean, same thing with Boise, like Boise, I get Oregon State, I guess Portland State's, Portland's not a state either. I guess it's a state university, but. Well, it's a big misunderstanding. Yeah. St. Vincent de Paul. Is that who DePaul University was named after? Yep, that's our guy. That's our guy in the flesh. St. Vinny. I think there's is St. Vincent de Paul. Um they're I think they're a very inclusive organization. I know Goodwill, I think I don't know for sure how uh, you feel, but I've seen No, I, I don't really feel inclusive towards Goodwill. Because I'll tell you, across the country, Goodwill has been having things called sheltered workshops for years where they pay people with disabilities sub-minimum wage and, and based off the labor that they can do, not off of a salary. And especially in Washington State on your Pacific Northwest, for many years, there were a lot of sheltered workshops that have closed down now and people with disabilities are trying to work towards getting more inclusive employment and customized. And 
Um, and the one like in the industries where a lot of people with disabilities are mainly getting employed are in food, flowers, filth, and filing. Because food? what about fun? Nobody's getting in. Is that no. That? No fun. Filth. We need a lot more of that. You That's know, what we fun. need to try to get. We need to advocate for filth, food, flowers, fun. And filing. Filing, finance, finance, maybe fibula. I mean, fibula. Um, I mean, could be fun. I mean, definitely. Like there have been some across the country. There have been um, chamber of commerces that have worked with disability service providers to identify jobs with the business community. But it's it's a newer thing um, now, and 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 now this month is just wrapping up the National Disability Employment Awareness Month where we showcase the the success of people with disabilities that are working out in the community in fully integrative jobs. And we even have scholars and college professors out there that have disabilities themselves. And, and, and there are a lot of them that are actually in the field of disability um, studies. My, themselves that have that disabilities that, we might that are college professors. Is that a position we might see you in, Will? Have you thought about, I think you know your stuff. I mean, you, you're a sharp, sharp kid, young man, guy, dude. Uh, I mean, I, mean, I want to go where somewhere where I can be more of my passion. Like, I really want to be either working in disability services or coaching sports at the college level or working in diversity and inclusion the I mean I have to see if the academic environment is for me because the problem is the academic environment and the process to get there is a lot more stress and labor and there has to be the right benefits and the mentors that are there who are willing to guide me um, out there and and the one scholar that I really look up to right now is a inclusive education and interdisciplinary professor at Rowan University in Dr. Justin Friedman, who has a disability himself. And he understands the college environment for students um, with um, disabilities. And right now for my assessment research and evaluation course, I'm working on a assessment, um, basically proposal on, on, in, on how instructional strategies can be used for helping um, college professors for students with disabilities right now. Smart. You're very smart. You guys, Pont in college, Will in college, respect. Fist bump. Boom. It's all about putting a lot on your plate and being able to handle it. Oh, That's it's, what you guys are doing. It's, it's so much. I mean, especially during my undergraduate time at Salisbury University, I was a president of an honor society and a club and doing everything else that I did while being a full time student and I'm a grad student working in graduate assistantship started my own advocacy group called the Equal Access Advocacy Collective in July with other disability advocates from overseas and across the country right now and and looking to do more stuff to be involved with anything that I can. Get a website. You need a website. Yeah, yeah, I'm working. I'm working on that. That's the next thing for me. And, and within these next um, couple weeks, I mean, I'm giving a presentation for University of Illinois for special ed majors. I have two conference presentations and a workshop and, and final papers and exams. Respect. Much, much respect. I love what you're doing. I, I think that's a future you could have is speaking. Um, you know, your presentation was great. And definitely there's people that need to hear what you have to share, probably more than what I have to say, what the X Factor has to say. People need to hear these messages, but- Without a doubt. Your positivity, man. Um, we appreciate you checking out the shows and um, definitely, I, Ponte, you have a quote. I had one that I wanted to share. Um, this one's from one of my favorite movies, Shawshank Redemption. Get busy living or get busy dying. That's goddamn right. Shawshank Redemption. 
you have two options get busy living or get busy dying so why not try to get busy living Shawshank Redemption favorite movie Haunt you got to see it I know there's a whole list of these shows you got to see but <laughs> you got to see the Shawshank Redemption man you'll laugh you'll cry it's a good one I'm definitely gonna have to check that one out. Uh, I love that quote, by the way. Mine for this week is uh, kind of it's close to home for me. Is don't forget to live in the moment because I feel like the majority of my life is spent. I'm a go getter, and I wouldn't have it any other way. So the majority of my life is spent looking towards the future and thinking about what I can do today to brighten my future and benefit it and put me in a position later on in life where you know I'm just really happy with the decisions that I made in the past. But with all that. You got to live in the moment sometimes. Every once in a while, you got to take a look at, at what you've done, what you've accomplished thus far, and say, you know what? This is pretty awesome, you know? Kudos to you. Give yourself a little pat on the back every once in a while because, hey, even, you know, maybe other people will, maybe other people won't. You can't really count on them, but you know you, and you know that all the work that you've put in, you know what you've done to get to the point that you are now. So it's very, very important to live in the moment from time to time and really sit back and say, you know what? I'm proud of myself. And I think we might have lost. Oh, there's B minor. <laughs> but you can are you hear me muted. now? Yep, now we can hear can you. Can you hear me now? Okay. I'm glad it didn't hang up on everybody because my computer, it said there was still 4%. It was lying. It was lying. It went to zero pretty quickly. But at least we have to wrap up. Um, live in the moment. I feel it. I understand it. I respect it dream as if you'll live forever live as if you'll die today james dean said that and the x factor doesn't know who james dean is so we'll move on we'll wrap up will did you have anything else any parting shots again thanks for being here with us i mean i mean i really i mean appreciate it and and just i would say out to the viewers watch crip camp on youtube or netflix so you can see true disability inclusion going on in there. And you can host your own um, screening with the guide, which CripCamp.com has available out there, as well as a couple of lesson plans available if people want to do them in their groups or with their teams, talking about power and justice and literacy. Good shout out. Good shout out right there. Crip Camp on Netflix. Check it out, drop Will a message, get in touch with us, leave a comment down below and we'll get that to Will. But you know how we always end this thing, right? If you're gonna walk, walk, walk on. On. let's I go. Love it. We got all three of us on time, on target, I love it. Stop that, cut, print, wrap it up.